Welcome to the Asher Acupuncture Podcast, sharing clinical tips and techniques to help you help more patients. Here's your host, Eric Shanky. Well, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. David Legg uh, to the show. I'm really interested in getting his insights on uh, treating the shoulder. Uh, Dr. Legg, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Good to be here. Dr. Legg, um, I've, my views on the Chinese concept of qi has really evolved in the last 25 years that I've been studying medicine. Uh, can you share any insights of uh, what qi means to you and has that, has your, has your perception of qi or your understanding of it, has it changed over time also? Um, it has to a certain extent. It's it's well, it's certainly a concept that we all struggle with. It's quite uh, quite a different concept from anything that we've grown up with in the West. So anybody studying Chinese medicine has the problem of you know having to wrestle uh, with a personal interpretation of what this means. Um, for me, in terms of Chinese medicine, uh, and I say that specifically because. In the, context, in the context of Chinese science and Chinese uh, cosmology uh, as a whole, qi might have taken on some slightly other and greater sort of um, uh, definitions. But in the concept of the body, I see uh, qi as representing the yang of the body and blood representing the yin. So qi and blood are merely the, you know, once in one sense, uh, the yin and yang uh, of uh, of physiology, and, and yeah. I, so that she, sorry, I I would say uh, I I like how you made that distinction between uh, the context of chi maybe in cosmology and the context of chi within the human body because I I think I think the definition of chi is so dependent on context I think it's important to define the context that we're talking about yes, so I, I, I agree a hundred percent on that. Yeah. So that for me, qi in the body is all observable energy or any observable activity, any essence, any indication of you know energy activity, energy use can be described as qi and blood can be described more or less as the uh, material basis mm. of that. So you, know, you have those ideas of the, you know, the qi leads the blood and the blood nourishes the qi, uh, standing that. In terms of... Um, things like the meridians and whatever, chi, it is chi and blood that both circulate. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Meridians and the chi and blood are both produced and stored by the internal organs. And uh, that, that's a basic concept too that I think uh, a lot of practitioners, sometimes they, they, they start to forget that uh, blood circulates together with the chi in the uh, <laughs> Jing Mai. And mm. so, so then they start to look for some separate system that the chi uh flows within and and uh yeah my my personal opinion is that they were the ancient chinese were giving a primitive description of the vascular system uh that also got a little mixed up with the uh, nervous system too because they didn't define that distinctly no that's right there and so for me that the the jigma the uh is still a metaphorical concept there where the ideas of uh of circulation, like, you know, they got the idea very clearly that there was circulation in the body, uh, and that that circulation involved not just the material, you know, the substance, substantive aspect, but also this energetic if information was information circulated, uh, you know, energy, or at least whatever the substrate of energy was was circulating there too. So, in one sense, they got an extremely fundamental um, physiological point hundreds and hundreds of years before that was accepted in the West. Um, for that, they should be given probably more credit. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Um, I recently wrote a blog post uh, because I learned that the word re respire, expire, inspire, uh, those those all have their, uh, at their root is the Latin word spiritus, which means breath, energy, uh, spirit mm. and, and uh also the greek term pneuma uh, has mm. the same connotation so i, I and the hindu word pra the sanskrit i was just going to say something about uh 
uh, the place where uh, where uh, the concept of chi and blood is most important for me in my work is in the diagnosis of pain. Uh, I think it's a very important and you know, fundamental distinction to make between the idea of a painful presentation of pain that is essentially or, or predominantly chi stagnation versus a, uh, a presentation that is essentially blood, uh, blood stagnation. Yeah. And for me, the difference is quite simple. Uh, chi stagnation tends to move around uh, in location and it's also very, has other variabilities in terms of the relationship to stress, uh, timing, you know, those kinds of things. The more variable it is, the more likely chi stagnation is a predominant factor, in which case you then have to rely on your distal points uh, because it's not the actual points of stagnation that are, are important. What's important is that the regulation of the circulation of chi and blood has been harmed some way and that you have to address that in a systemic kind of a way. So distal points and perhaps uh, some bladder shoe points are an essential part of the treatment in those cases. Whereas if the problem is essentially blood stagnation, and by that I mean it's really got a very fixed location. That's the key that's the key factor about blood stagnation. It's always in the same place uh, and doesn't particularly vary uh, in terms of time or presentation with, with um, in relationship to activity and whatnot. Um, uh, and that in those situations, really, it's the local points that are the really, the local and our share points are the predominant points. And the distal points, you know, come a distant second often uh, in their importance. And that's a, that's a key distinction uh, to make. And of course, many of the painful conditions that present in the clinic are simple blood stagnation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and thanks for that reminder because uh, as an osher acupuncturist, I tend to get caught up in only treating the local points. And uh, it's important to watch for those patterns that are shifting around and, and then sure. incorporate distal points like that. Thanks sure. for pointing yeah. that out. Um, and there's a good segue into the uh, main point of the interview is to get your insights into the shoulder. treating yeah. the sho shoulder. And I wondered, uh, is there is there one problem of the shoulder that you find most common, uh, a particular muscle muscle involved, or uh, it, it, what what's well, the most I, common problem you see? I would see? say definitely, without a doubt, um, rotator cuff injuries, particularly supraspinatus, is the most common um, complaint that I see. Uh, um, and I find that response really extremely well to acupuncture. So. Uh, and, uh, and and could you could you describe what what would be the typical presentation of a patient with a supraspinatus problem? What, what, uh, the typical presentation, uh, like, the, like very, the very simple one, is that if somebody both if they abduct their arm and touches the lateral part of their their you know, the deltoid patches they call it that area over the yeah. deltoid and lateral areas, you know straight away that's going to be a supraspinatus problem there, so and that. Really, you can move really quickly into confirming that diagnosis. Um, there so are again, we're looking other... we're looking for that painful arc, right? At about ninety so degrees, is that that combination of painful arc with a, with the hand on there? That's just a total giveaway mm -hmm. in terms of a presentation. But one of the points, one of the main points I'd like to make about the shoulder is that out of all of the areas of the body, the musculoskeletal system, the shoulder really is so amenable to proper, you know, ma manual orthopedic kind of examination. Really, if you just go through the area in a fairly consistent and, and, and logical uh, fashion, you can diagnose most problems of the shoulder. And do you mean, uh, uh, do you mean by using orthopedic testing or is there... It's the same or just even, yeah, orthopedic, not so much the clever orthopedic tests. I'll talk about some of those in a minute there, but just a standard orthopedic diagnosis where, you know, after taking a case history, you move to do a passive range of movements, you do active resisted range of movements, uh, you do any special tests that might uh, might be interested, and then you palpate thoroughly all of the structures on the shoulder. And even the way the shoulder, you know, sits there on the body, it's extremely easy to start here on the medial side and just work your round, way around it through the clavicle, the joint, the, you know, the soft tissue attachments, all the way around the back and to explore the relationship perhaps with the, the neck and the shoulder 
at the back. It's a really kind of pretty straightforward area uh, and very satisfying too, because often you start with a patient who you really don't understand by the time you start the, the, you know, from the case, you haven't got a clear idea of what it is, but by the time you finish your examination, often, you know, you know, you certainly know how, which kind of area to treat. Me. And it, it, the the typical tests for supraspinatus are the empty can and full can test. Do you use yep, those? Yep. Or? No, I like the empty can. And I, I now do that as my main test for the the combination of the empty can, positive empty can, plus a uh, you know a very you know Usher kind of reaction when you touch the uh, insertion of the supraspinatus and, and on that, the shoulder. And that's near near LI fifteen or a little anterior to that. Yeah, so I teach it is I just get people to. I don't know whether you can see this, but I won't stand up a little bit here. But if you stand with your elbow close by the side, mm. or you sit and your fingers, the patient, the examiner's fingers are in the front of the shoulder. What you do is you just get them to rotate their arm internally and externally, externally rotate, and you should be able to feel in most people the bicipital groove. Yep, and supraspinatus attaches to the lateral aspect of that of that groove slightly superior. Mm. So it's a matter of identifying the groove, moving to the lateral side of it, and then working your way up towards the acromion. <coughs> and that is where supraspinatus attaches. And that's fairly, once if they jump, when you touch that, you can be pretty sure <laughs> that something's going on there. Uh, that, the was, most, that was a great tip. The, one of the most common disorders there that you know, you can miss or become confused in this area is the acromioclavicular joint. Uh, and that should palpating the, you should always palpate the acromioclavicular joint <coughs> um, in supraspinatus or, you know, in any shoulder problem, of course, when diagnosing, you should always just run your fingers over the joint to check for stagnation there. But very often you'll get the two things together, um, supraspinatus and the acromioclavicular acromioclavicular problems there and if that's the case you really need to address the acromioclavicular stuff first before you get on to the tendon. And and once you've uh, <clears throat> come up that you're satisfied with the diagnosis of a supraspinatus problem, what, what's the typical treatment uh, for you? What do you like to do? I do a very strong, this is one of the very few treatments that's, that's routine with me. Uh, I will do for most, for almost everybody, a combination of large and fifth, large intestine fifteen, large intestine sixteen, uh, either angled towards the trigger point of the muscle or towards LI fifteen, going up under, going underneath the acromion. Uh, small intestine twelve, which is in the uh, belly of the muscle. So you've got those three points: small intestine twelve, large intestine 15, four to sixteen and fifteen. And I'll often combine that with LI eleven. Uh, and I will connect uh, LI15 and LI16 uh, with a, with electrostim, electrostimulation, and have the uh, the active terminal on LI15. Oh, I see, I see. And I've had some trouble with um with uh, supraspinatus tears with a, what's called a full thickness tear. Uh, I found I haven't gotten satisfactory results when it's a full thickness tear. A partial thickness tear seems to respond well. Uh, well, a full thickness tear, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that or yep. experience of that. First, you've got to be really clear about what the full thickness tear is. Yeah, it's not as if the thing goes. It's not as if the, it's not like the rope is separated. Uh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, there's a difference whether it's retracted or not. Getting a spike and pushing it through the rope. Yeah, that's mm. more like a full, full thickness tear. Mm. Yeah, and then just in terms of severity, they're going to be more severe than the partial uh, tear in general. But, of course, you know, you've always got to remember that the, the variability in patient response and uh, vitality and whatnot can always, you know, someone can come in with a full thickness tear that still can respond quite well. <coughs> and somebody with a partial tear might just be a bit, you know, deficient and not so responsive perhaps to uh, to the treatment. But in whereas it used to scare me a bit, now I just figure, right, that's just one step extra in severity. Um uh, and my, the treatment really doesn't vary, and uh, I don't don't change it on the basis of that ultrasound report, because um, that's essentially what we're talking about here. Is that well, well, we don't use MRIs for shoulders very often in this country. I don't know what it's like in the US. Uh, yeah. We would just use an ultrasound uh, to assess. 
in the U.S., um, the ultrasound's considered not as accurate as the MRI for diagnosing. I think you get a lot of uh, false negatives. So yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's what I've heard from orthopedists, uh, but it's that's a little out of my area of specialty. Um, mm -hmm. When you said you needle Li15 for the supraspinatus, you're <laughs> do you really mean that Osher point there? Uh, uh, no, the actually. Spotlight? Li15. This was a sort of a, a bit of a moment for me in my early days there, when you know I used to try and needle it often with people lying on their you know lying on their back, mm. so a supine. And Li15 is not a particularly useful point generally <laughs> in that position there. But as soon as you roll them over and their arms sort of you know abduct and the the, the eyes of the shoulder become apparent, and that's you know with, with their arms either hanging over the side of the uh the, the 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 bench or slightly sort of flexed i've got a little ledge under my head piece there in that position li15 is nicely over the over the tendon and so what i do is i just find the eye and just needle it exactly not like an arch point but like a local point where i try and just needle perpendicularly into the bottom of that anterior uh, shoulder eye so you're not trying to go into the subacromial space on LA15 with that way. You're, you're just maybe running anterior to the humeral head. Is that, is that? If I'm going to be treating somebody supine for any particular reason, or you know, maybe they don't want to lie on their back or they've got some other problem that requires them to be supine, uh, and I'm treating a supersomatis as part of that, um, I abandon that previous treatment and what I will do is really just put the try and feed the two needles on either side of the tendon so I've just find the sore point and I don't worry about the knee or the shoulder eyes at all and just needle on either side of the tendon subacromially mm. you know so angled upwards and underneath the chromium process uh, and then join those with electro and that's what I would do in that situation and uh, then if if you are treating them prone uh you mentioned their arms above the table do you have a little arm rest for them you mean under the headrest yeah. kind of yeah and yeah. and then when you're needling li16 that way uh are are you uh, threading along the tendon then uh, to get yeah, in the well, subacromial space that way unless it's more acute See, a lot of people come in with situations where um uh, there will actually be trigger points in the uh, distal end of the of the muscle, and they and they they're really worth treating, especially in an acute situation. Uh, so I always feel for those, and if they are there, I will needle those. So LI16 then becomes a, a trigger point kind of approach. If there isn't a trigger point there, then no, I will needle underneath the acromion towards LI15. I see. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing your insights. Yeah. That that's a. Uh... Uh, valuable insights into treating the supraspinatus. I really appreciate that. Okay. Um, I just to just cut a couple of extra tips there. That yeah. as people recover, that they've been over, they've been recruiting other muscles to avoid turning on supraspinatus there. And so often, as as you're coming to the end of a course of treatment, you'll need to pay attention to uh, anterior deltoid and, in particular, um, coracobrachialis. Mm. Uh, uh, there's a point, Jian Nei Ling, which is halfway between the anterior axillary fold and large intestine 15, that is right over coracobrachialis. Mm -hmm. And that's a really worthwhile addition to one of your last treatments. And I found when I needle the coracobrachialis, usually we'll get a local twitch response yep. there. Yep. Is, that, is that what you're looking for typically? I don't mind. I don't actually look for twitches but I'm happy to see it when they're there. <laughs> it, do you look for soreness then when you're needling that or do you just, you just. Uh... Dirty. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay. Really? That's what I want. Proper good dirty there. And you often get a twitch at the same time, but you often don't. So, and I don't think it matters. And it's, I think this is a distinction that the dry needlers are trying to establish, which is a completely false distinction. Mm. You know, they try to emphasize the importance of the twitch because they don't want to emphasize the uh, sure sensation because that belongs to acupuncturists. And the, you know, that's a, this, you know, that's a distinction that has nothing to do with the clinical reality and everything to do with uh, trying to sort of maintain this sort of psychic separation. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, because that tw the twitch response is a uh, valid form of Da Chi. It's a subcategory yeah, of Da Chi. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Watch for Eric's book on advanced Asher acupuncture techniques. 
Don't miss being notified of its release date and when the latest blogs on useful clinical tips and techniques are posted. Stay informed and up to date by signing up now at our website, asher-acupuncture.com. Now back to the program. Um, it sounds like you use a lot of uh, electroacupuncture in your practice. Is that true? Nah, yep. Yeah. Yep. What would you say of 50% of the patients you see, you do mm. electroacupuncture? Depends on the day. Depends on the day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, generally, if you want to buy a definition for, uh, for using electro, I tend to use it for fibrous tissue. Oh, okay. So uh, tendons, love it. Uh, discs, love it. Mm. Um, um, they're the two main, you know, I have very, I rarely treat a tendon without using electro and would rarely treat a disc without using um, electro. And when you said fibrous tissue, it, it, my mind also went to uh, when you've got a really old uh, sure point that the muscles uh, got yeah, a little fibrous a, too. What it, do you... was, it does add something. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. When when would you refer out on a shoulder? What what signs do you look for? Is it just lack of response that then you would refer out? Or yep, yep. There's almost no shoulder problem there that I, you know, there are certainly frozen shoulder. Uh, some people report a lot of success with frozen shoulder there. I my results are really intermittent. Some people respond really well. Other people don't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know whereas almost every other shoulder problem, I'm reasonably confident uh, of my treatment, and would you know would we expect a good result? But with frozen shoulder, I say straight up, all I can do is give this a go. Yeah. You know, generally I can say I can get rid of a lot of the pain for you, and give you a certain amount of increased movement, uh, and then we'll hit a plateau, and there's absolutely no point. You know, if you're not going to respond, you're not going to respond. So it's not you know not something I can offer. But some people do. Mm -hmm. People just keep on, the movement gets better and better and better uh, and you just keep on going and, you know, but they're the people who you could say have come in with a reason, reasonably new frozen shoulder, so less than six months old, uh, who walk out after a couple of months treatment without any shoulder restriction or pain, uh, they're really a minority. Uh, you know, and I know that for, if you treat them very aggressively and persistently, yeah, you, know, you can shove them along a reasonable way there, but for a lot of people, that's, you know, they don't necessarily want to do that. The the expense, the time, all of that sort of stuff. Once it's settled down, they've got used to working and used to moving with that slight shoulder restriction. Most people would just uh, happy to wait until it goes away. They they just learn to live with it. If the pain level's tolerable, then just yeah, and the knowledge yeah. go away. Yeah, it, it clinically for me, uh, the majority of patients will see some improvement in one or two, uh, but three is kind of my golden rule. If we don't see some improvement in three, then I'll yeah, I uh, think give that's up. A good, that's a good golden rule to have. Yeah. yeah, and patients really, as I'm sure you've been become aware, patients really respond well to that honesty and uh, uh, you know understanding your own limits straight up. Yeah, that's right. I, I I really think that's part of being an expert is you you know what you can and cannot that's, do and. Yeah. And uh, it, it, we all want to help as many people as we can, but dragging treatment on and on is just uh, not a good, not yeah, a good way to treat a patient. Promising results that you can't deliver. I think that's a very bad. Yeah, uh, I agree. very I, bad I, look for a practitioner. I agree, a hundred percent. Doctor Leg, how can uh, listeners learn more about your work? Um, well, I guess my my the main way is through my text, close to the bone. That's where I've really tried and put down all the results of the, the product of all my experience. Uh, you know, it's been a, lot, been a lifetime journey really there. And so I've now got a third edition out that uh, uh, I think will probably be my last. <laughs> yeah, and it's a fantastic it's, book. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with Close to the Bone. I've... Yeah, it's helped a lot of people over the, over the years there. And one of my great prides in life is seeing someone come up with a, you know, a dog-eared, heavily annotated <laughs> you know, copy that they've been carrying on. Let's love to see that. That's, yeah, uh, it, it's fantastic. And, and you have a newer work, uh, the Jing Jin. Yeah, the Jing Jin, that's just something that uh, came as a result of some exploration of this material that should have made sense to me, but didn't. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was, I found it extremely irritating that I've been 
supposed to be an expert in treating musculoskeletal stuff with acupuncture and here they're you know what seemed to be the core material to deal with the muscular system and it just didn't make any sense to me whatsoever and i want to i want to <laughs> i want to question you more on that but i think that would be good to do a separate interview on the jing jin topic if you'd be willing sometime in the future uh, sometime in the future no, that'd be that'd be fine yeah so uh, i'll put links to uh is there a website you want people to go to or is there one place it's better for them to find your book than another? I've, I know your books are available on Amazon. I could just put Amazon links below. Uh, Red Wing is, should be the place. Okay. In I'll the put... States. They're, they're the guys that should be able to, you know, they have copies. They should be able to send them out quickly there. Uh, you might want to put my email address in for people. Okay. There, and there, is a, there is a website I have got. A, but, um, it's, you know, it's only half constructed. and There is a bit of a store in there. Where it can be bought directly, but really, it's just a postage or whatever. It's certainly better for people to get it in the states from an American distributor. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll put links to all that uh, below, and yeah. I, I really appreciate your time, uh, Doctor yeah, no, Leg. All. all right, thank you. Good to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Doctor Leg, yeah, I'll, I'll cut the interview there. Um, yeah, I, I may have mentioned I'm writing a book now too, uh, and boy, it sure is challenging to try to write a book. You have any advice yeah, for an aspiring author? Just keep on plugging away. <laughs> it's uh, a grind. It's a grind. This thing there. Yeah, well, you know, computers have made it a lot easier. I can't, I can't imagine, yeah. Uh, so, that, you know, just the bits that I, one of the things that I've had, I, I did was I just write the bits that I was in my head at the time. So I didn't mm. do it consecutively necessarily. I just kept on, you know, if I had a good something to say, I'd just write that paragraph or write that two paragraphs and whatnot mm. there. You know, if you keep on doing that, then it becomes easy to fill in the gaps between your paragraphs. You know, right, the right. Bits that you do know what you're talking about, the bits that you might have to have a think about it, you know, that, that kind of thing there. And right now, uh, I think my manuscript's maybe like 95% done, so maybe I'm halfway there. Um, oh, <laughs> but uh, like getting, getting it laid out and all that stuff is kind of daunting. Yes, it is. And really... I did the early ones, the early two editions I did on my own. And while I, you know, they served their purpose, mm -hmm. they were pretty primitive in terms of what's available and people's design sense. And so I employed a designer um, for my last one. For the third edition? Uh, for the third edition. And she gave me a, a, a style sheet that okay. I was able to work with in uh, using PageMaker, you know, or whatever it is called these days, in design. Okay. And, and oh, so uh, then you use that... Uh, to lay it out, yeah. To lay it out. Oh, okay. So she gave you a kind of a sample page that you followed that? On oh, the... Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, list of headings. Because what you know, the things that become, you can easily lose sight of, like your he heading hierarchies. Right. Uh, fonts. Right. Uh, spacings. A um, lot of you know, ta um, numbered lists, bullet lists, tables. Do you, There's a lot of stuff in there that you know, someone with a with a professional eye mm -hmm. does a much better job than somebody who's sort of learning it all from the first time. Yeah, and I don't have a good artistic sensibility, so. So if you're going to do it um, self-publish, mm -hmm. then I would recommend that you pay a designer. You know, somebody it doesn't have to be a top designer. It can be if somebody who's just starting out, give them a few hundred bucks, or you know, I think I probably paid a fifteen hundred or something mm -hmm. just to get that style sheet there, uh, and that was well worth it. And um, it, could you share who that was with me that I could consider them to to do that? Well, it's a friend of mine, Karen Vance. She was the lady who's done all my illustrations. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I'll yeah, send, send happy to give you a uh, give you her, her number, but you know, I'm sure there's somebody just down the road from you. Who's, yeah, probably, uh, probably. That. And then, of course, the other option, which I've never tried, but apparently, there's all of these Indian designers online. Right, right. He'll, he'll pop that out for a couple of hundred bucks overnight. Yeah, Fiverr, Elance, or something like that. Yeah, well, right. I'll just steal it from somewhere else. But you'll, what you'll get is a is a, is a template, right, or a choice of templates that uh, that look that look good for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Leg, do you ever give any seminars? Well, I do regularly, I, but uh, and I've got one coming up next year in Los Angeles uh, with uh, Lotus. Oh, you do? Okay. Oh, yeah. I wanted yeah. to ask too about uh, yeah. about on, uh, in in uh, July. 
But I used to come over every year and do three or four classes, and that's just dropped off a bit over the last few years. I've had a few family dramas here, and I had a couple of visa problems. Oh, okay. uh, I was getting into the States. Mm. Uh, I was banned there for a while. Really? You're on the so no-fly now, list or something? I was on the, but basically, yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me in. It's because your controversial views on Chi, huh? They're... Yeah, that's right. That's exactly <laughs> <laughs> um uh the lotus people uh i actually the it's tina chen and and her brothers they That's right. they i graduated from the same schools and they were a year or two ahead of me and their father okay. their father kind of started the lotus thing and he was one of my instructors so i have a little bit of a oh, okay uh relationship with them um how did you get connected with them? Do you use their herb products? Oh, they, they were put out by somebody, uh, one of our companies here. Uh-huh. And they were just, I asked the person, you know, who would they recommend for seminars to do there? And my, that, my name came up. And uh, so I did a webinar for them and they liked this, liked this material. So they said to come over. So I've got a, it'll be a weekend next July, I think it is. Yeah, I'll do my best to make it to that. Yeah, I think that that's where I made contact with you after you uh, gave that uh, webinar. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you're associated with any colleges, I'm <laughs> getting to the. I always love to come over just to sort of a break from normal clinic life and that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not too hard to convince to come over and do a weekend or. And um, do you use much herbs in your practice? No, not much. Yeah, I, I mainly use some blood activating herbs. I found it's uh, good for patients with pain to take some blood activating herbs. Sure, you mean like sh 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 or that kind um, of thing? It, it, kind of like that. Uh, the main herb I use is Tian Chi, the the um, raw raw Tian Chi herb, the Noto Ginseng, pseudo Noto Ginseng. Yeah, Siberia. Yeah. I think all that Siberian Ginseng is there. Uh, right? No, that that. Uh, so this is, I think it's Radix Noto Ginseng. Maybe that's what it okay. is. It's, it's the San Chi or Tian Chi. It's a okay. blood activator trauma herb. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. I just, you know, I'm not, I'm not really a prescriber. I'm not much a taker of things myself. So yeah, yeah. Not to, tend not and, to give up. And, yeah. and uh, is one of the reasons I don't like to do internal medicine that you just have to sell too many things to the patients. <laughs> I just oh, like to it. treat them. Treat it's them. It's hard. You know, it is, it is hard. And, uh, you know, patients often, you know, they just want the drugs and not the, um, not, not any lifestyle changes. Right, right. As well, it's also a big part of Chinese medicine, so that is tough. Are you, um, you still in practice full time or? Well, I, yeah, I do three days a week, which for me is full time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is why I can sit here on a Monday. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. And it's there, yeah. All right, Dr. Leg, I really appreciate you okay. taking the time. It's it great to finally connect with you. And uh, when I get this, it, it's probably going to be a couple weeks before I post this. And uh, I'll make sure I send you a link. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, thank, okay. thank thanks you again, mate. Dr. Leg. Bye. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Asho Acupuncture Podcast. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a question, topic idea, guest idea, or a particular technique you'd like to hear discussed on the show, contact us at our website, ashu-acupuncture.com. That's A-S-H-I-acupuncture.com.